I don't know about you guys, but I am tired of this weather. I have two nieces visiting from the Midwest, and I took them this morning up on Mary's Peak, figuring we'd get maybe above the clouds and so forth. At 11 o'clock this morning, it was snowing on Mary's Peak. There was snow coming down on Mary's Peak this morning, OK? Whew. OK. Um, so what I want to do today is go through, I'm not going to go through the immune system in any detail. I've just decided there's too much there uh, for us to cover in a reasonable amount of time here. I'm going to cover a couple of very brief things with respect to the immune system. Then I'm going to talk about um, cancer, particularly with respect to oncogenes, and with respect to tumor suppression, particularly this uh, gene called P53. Then uh, we'll turn our attention to uh, some stuff that students generally find fairly easy to understand, and that's uh, carbohydrate structure, uh, which has a lot of nomenclature that I think you get in organic chemistry. So that's what's on tap for today. So the immune system, of course, is our body's protection against the outside world. Um, the immune system is remarkable in its flexibility. Okay? Um, there are um, two components to our immune system called the adaptive and the innate uh, immune system. The innate system is rooted in protection, sort of general protection mechanisms against uh, pathogens. And an adaptive system, which is able to adapt itself uh, to um, the various um, pathogens and so forth that it encounters. And it's the adaptive that we frequently spend a lot of time talking about that I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, but I will very briefly uh, mention. The adaptive immune system is able to develop protection against organisms or things it has never seen before. And it's really remarkable how that immune system uh, actually does that. And the Details of that are far beyond what we can go through here to talk about. We all know uh, that the immune system uh, operates uh, through the use of antibodies. And antibodies are proteins that have the ability to recognize and bind to specific structures. And they're structure-based. They're not molecule-based. All right. So they, because they're structure-based, they will only bind to certain molecules. But there are antibodies, for example, that will bind to nucleic acids. There are antibodies that will bind to proteins. There are antibodies that will bind to carbohydrates, uh, and so forth. So they are structure-specific. Um, in terms of the adaptive immune system, there are two types of cells that we talk about. Um, the B cells, which are the antibody uh, producing cells for the most part, and the T cells, which are involved in helping to produce the antibodies. Those are called helper T cells. And uh, a cytotoxic group of T cells called killer T cells. And it's the killer T cells that actually do uh, the business of killing of uh, organisms that they um, encounter. Um, it's the helper T cells, as I mentioned last time, that are the, the T cells that are involved in the um, uh, attack by HIV. And HIV specifically attacks uh, and rec recognizes and binds to a protein called CD4. And CD4 can be seen right, um, thought I had it right there. Uh, there, OK. So this is a, um, a scheme not of HIV infection, but actually of how uh, a helper T cell helps uh, the um, uh, immune system to recognize and to create antibodies that are uh, directed against things. CD4 plays a role in recognition of this uh, class uh, called the major histocompatibility class. You can call it the, H, uh, the MHC, which is simply a protein that is sticking off of a cell that has encountered an antigen. So there's another term that you need to know. So I said you need to know what an antibody is, which is a protein that recognizes and binds to a specific structure. And the antigen is actually the thing that it recognizes and binds to. Okay. Now, I'm going to briefly tell you one way in which antibodies uh, can be produced. Um, and they result, uh, one way that can happen is through uh, a cell becoming infected. So if a cell becomes infected, let's say by a virus, uh, for example, that cell is kind of doomed, okay? Because um, that cell likely is going to be killed in the process of the replication of the virus. 
And if the cell uh, is able to recognize what's going on, it can start trying to break up the invader into pieces. And it's going to have a protease, for example, that will break up the viral proteins into pieces, saying these are foreign. And what they will do, what, a, what an infected cell will do, is put on its outside, on this complex, some of the pieces that it encounters. So those pieces are flags to the helper T cells that say, whoa, here's an infected cell, and here's what it recognized, okay? Or here's what, it, what infected it. Now, it's a complicated process, uh, but ultimately, the B cells uh, get stimulated by the helper T cells to make antibodies against that uh, invader. And that's how we have our immune system that actually functions. As they say, that's a lot more than I'm going to go, in, go into here. But suffice it to say that the uh, ability of the immune system to flexibly adapt and make antibodies is remarkable. So to give you an idea, we estimate that our immune system is able to make one trillion different antibodies. And you say, OK, that's a large number. So what? All right. Well, here's the so what. The so what is that our genome only has 7 billion base pairs. It's roughly 140 times more antibodies than bases. Well, how in the world is it that an immune system, which needs to make protein, has 140 antibodies for every single base that's in the genome? Well, the answer to that question is a little complicated, but one way that it happens is through shuffling. Okay? Just like you can take a deck of cards, it has 52 cards, and you can shuffle that deck of cards uh, in an enormous number of ways, so too can you shuffle exons that code for antibodies. And through the shuffling of exons, one can create an enormous diversity of antibodies using a limited number of base pairs. And so that's actually what happens, one of the ways in which antibody diversity um, is realized uh, by the body and by the immune system. So that's a very important consideration for um, uh, the immune system. When I talk about antibodies, this structure is something that's uh, important. This is a schematic structure representing uh, what an antibody actually looks like. In reality, you rarely see it look like a Y, but you do see it look like it's got these big arms that, that, that hang off of it. The antibody has several regions that are what we call constant uh, domains, okay? and that is that they don't seem to vary too much from one antibody to another. And then they have variable regions, and the variable regions are out here. Okay? The variable regions are the places where the uh, antibody binds to the antigen. And it's through the swapping that these variable regions are as varied as they are. Okay? You'll notice that there are two types of chains here, one chain called a heavy chain that is shown here, another chain called the light chain that's shown here, and these are repeated on the other side. And yes, the sequences themselves are also repeated on the other side. Okay? So that's the structure um, of an antibody. The C domain stands for the constant domain, the V domain stands for the variable domain. Okay. One of the things that, um, well that, that this I s simply shows um, antibodies binding to antigens. The antigens are these sort of fluffy looking things uh, here. There are several classes. There are several classes of antibodies, and I won't go through uh, all that with you here. But you hear of IgA and IgG and IgE. Those are different classes of antibodies that our immune system uses, and those classes of antibodies have specific. Um, uh, they have. Um, functions that correspond to each class, like some, for example, are found in mucus, others are found in the bloodstream, and, and things like that. Have you ever heard the term monoclonal antibody? It means that it's a, um, an antibody that someone has essentially cloned. So if you have an immune cell that is making an antibody that is of particular um, use, then isolating that immune cell and reproducing that immune cell in billions and billions of copies makes what's called an a, a, a monoclonal antibody. The difference between a monoclonal antibody and an antibody is that when our immune system uh, attacks something, 
it typically attacks it with several different antibodies. Now, that might seem a little odd, but let me explain why that's important. So let's imagine that I have a, um, a protein that I'm studying, and I want to have, we use antibodies in the laboratory to bind to proteins specifically. And so let's say I want some antibodies against a protein that I'm interested in. I could take my protein that I'm working with it, and I could inject it into a bunny rabbit. It's very commonly done. It doesn't hurt the bunny rabbit. And the bunny rabbit's um, immune system will see this protein as foreign. That's what happens in the first step of making antibodies. The immune system will see it as foreign. And on recognizing it as foreign, it will start producing antibodies against that uh, protein that's been injected into the cell. The antibodies that are produced, some will recognize one part of the protein, others will recognize another part of the protein, and others will recognize another part. And you can imagine that given the size of a protein, we might, there might be, oh, several dozen or even a hundred different antibodies, each of which might, ri might recognize a specific portion of a protein. The portion of a protein that any given antibody recognizes is known as an epitope. It's a specific structure, an epitope, E-P-I-T-O-P-E. So now you know that if I have a protein and I have antibodies, let's say I take that protein and I now pull it out of the bunny rabbit and I put it onto a column and I take all the things that stick to it. I would have all the antibodies that stick to that protein. They would be very useful for me in my laboratory, but each one of those antibodies would be recognizing different portions of that protein. They would not be clonal because there would be a mixture of all those different antibodies that are in there. On the other hand, if I said, well, I am very interested in an antibody that recognizes this tiny piece, this specific epitope of this protein, and not all the other things that's there. If I could isolate the antibody, the, the, the immune cell that makes that antibody, then I could use that immune, immune cell to make copies of only that antibody, because each immune cell will only make one antibody against one epitope. So by isolating that uh, immune cell that makes that one antibody against that one anti epitope, I have isolated and made a monoclonal antibody. One thing, it's the only thing that that antibody is going to recognize. You have a question written all over your face. Does the cell make the epitope or yeah, the epitope? The epitope comes from the antigen. So the antigen is the invader, whether it's a virus, whether it's a protein, whatever it happens to be. So the epitope is part of the invader. Okay? Can two different proteins have the same epitope? Yes, they can. They can't, because an epitope is simply a, a, a specific structure, and you can find that structure on two different proteins. Yes? Yes? Okay, very good question. So what, why are monoclonal antibodies useful? They're actually very useful for, for uh, medical purposes. Um, there's a, um, uh, a breast tumor uh, that, for example, um, recogn uh, that is uh, resulting from too many copies of a specific protein on a surface of a cell. And the additional copies of these proteins stimulate the cell to divide uncontrollably. Okay? So one of the treatments for that is to make antibodies, a monoclonal antibody, against a very specific thing, because you don't want it attacking all kinds of cells. You want to attack a, a specific epitope that's on this uh, protein that is on uh, in too high of a copy in these cells. So you treat the patient with this monoclonal antibody, and what it does is it, it covers up that protein so that it doesn't stimulate the cell to divide uncontrollably. That's a monoclonal an antibody called Herceptin, and the protein that it recognizes is called HER, H-E-R. And so that's one uh, use. There are many, many uses, monoclonal uses, uh, uses of monoclonal antibodies. Other questions? Okay, well that's moving us in the direction actually of oncogenes, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about cancer and oncogenes. So you have, each one of us has in our cells several hundred genes, each of which are capable of causing uncontrolled growth. And uncontrolled growth in a multicellular organism we know is cancer. So why is it that we have genes that will kill us? Right? Well, it's kind of a long story, but let me tell you a briefly, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the term, 
when we talk about signaling. Okay? Cells uh, in a multicellular organism have an elaborate set of controls that they have to go through before they divide. We want cell division to be controlled. For example, we want my left leg to be the same length as my right leg, right? ideally. And uh, to a reasonable approximation, they are. I don't want this growing to you know, make me a seven-foot person and this one growing to make me a five-foot person because I would have a hard time walking. Right? So controlling cell division is a very, very important function in a multicellular organism. And so how does the cell know when to divide and not to divide? And one of the ways it knows is by through hormonal stimulation. Hormones are ways that our cells communicate with each other. Okay? So if I am a cell, I'm a bone cell that gets the signal it's time to divide, then I will divide and do my thing. Well, you start imagining now that, well, if I have hormones or, and these hormones are interacting with proteins on the cell surface, if I have these hormones that are controlling the cell growth, something goes wrong with the hormone, or something goes wrong with the protein it interacts with, or something goes wrong with the signal once it gets inside the cell, the signal may be misread. And so if the signal keeps saying, divide, 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 the cell is going to do what it's told to do. It's going to continue to divide, divide, divide. So screwing up that signaling that happens with a cell is a very uh, important consideration in the formation of a cancer. Okay? So um, that's one really good example. So how does something become cancerous? How does a cell become cancerous? Well, let's imagine that I have this protein sitting on the surface of my cell, and its job is to bind to this growth hormone that says grow. Okay? So it's normally sitting there waiting for this hormone to come along, and it says grow, and it does its thing. Well, if my cell mutates and makes a mutant version of that protein, where it thinks it's binding to hormone all the time, what's it going to do? It's going to continually tell the cell to divide. So mutation changed the function of that signaling protein. And as a consequence, the cell loses all control. Well, that's, that happens in a lot of cancers. A lot of different cancers have their origins in that. The normal function of the cell is not to cause cancer. The normal function of the cell is to control cell division. But when that control is interrupted or that control is screwed up, then the cell is either not going to divide when it should, which won't cause a cancer, all right, or it's going to divide uncontrollably, which will cause a cancer. So we have a name for, and, and what's, what's essential for uh, formation of a um, cancer is some kind of a mutation. Some kind of a mutation is essential for that to happen. So we have these genes that, we, um, that play critical roles in the decision to divide. These are the ones I'm talking about here. These genes play critical roles in the decision to divide, and they have a name. They're called proto-oncogenes. These are genes that play critical roles in the decision to divide. Now, the proto-oncogene is unmutated. It functions perfectly normally. It's waiting for the hormone. It doesn't tell the cell to divide until the hormone gets there. Okay. When the hormone gets there, it says divide. The hormone's gone. It stops signaling. So a proto-oncogene functions perfectly normally. If I mutate a proto-oncogene, I create something that will not function normally. And that is called an oncogene. So the oncogene is the mutated form. The proto-oncogene is the unmutated form. The mutated form obviously causes some severe problems. Well, what favors mutation? What favors mutation? Well, we think of pollutants. Okay. We think of DNA adducts. You guys have already seen all these things. You think of thymine dimers. All these things are going to favor mutation. So when you put yourself in a situation where you have any of those things going on, then it's more likely you're going to have mutations going on inside of your cells. And the more mutations you have, the more likely you're going to form an oncogene from a proto-oncogene. Make sense? Everybody with me? There are hundreds of these. Okay? There are some that are known that a single base pair mutation will convert a cell from a normal cell into a, we call it a transformed cell. 
and un one with uncontrolled growth, a single base pair of mutation. So when people worry about clean air, clean water, good food, right? There's a very good reason why they worry about those things because the more of those problems that you have associated with your air, your water, and your food, the more likely you are to have problems with DNA replication and the more problems you'll have with replication. Now, one of the there are many different um, oncogenes, and some of the oncogenes have, uh, I'm sorry, proto-oncogenes have interesting functions. One of these is called P53, and I want to talk about that one briefly because it's relevant to what we have talked about. P53 is something we call a tumor suppressor. It's a tumor suppressor. Its normal function is to look out for when things get out of control and stop the cell from getting out of control. It's kind of like a parent. Okay? It's kind of like a parent. So what does P53 do? P53 uh, is what people refer to as the guardian of the cell. It's the guardian of the cell. This protein does a lot of different things, but one of the very important things that it does is that it checks that DNA replication has completed properly. Now, remember, you've got 7 billion base pairs in your genome that have to be replicated every time a cell divides. You can imagine there's a lot of complexity there. You've got all those histones. You've got all those repairs that have to happen. All those things have to happen in order for your chromosomes to perfectly replicate. Okay. Well, if there's a problem during replication, you'd sure like to know. Because problems during replication can give rise to mutation. And mutation, of course, we, as we've said, give rise to uncontrolled growth if it happens within a proto-oncogene. So to ensure that the cell is not going forth with division, when there has been a problem in replication, P53 is present. So I said P53 makes sure that replication proceeds properly. What happens? Replication is a phase of the eukaryotic cell cycle. There's actually a cycle that a cell goes through that involves synthesis of um, materials, including DNA, that are necessary for it to go through mitosis. When P53, I'm sorry, when this DNA replication occurs, P53 is watching guard. At the end of the replication process, P53 is looking for a signal that says everything is done and that we are now ready for mitosis. If P53 does not get that signal, okay, then it knows that something has happened during the replication process that has stopped the replication process. It's most likely a, a repair of a, DNA, a piece of DNA that cannot be repaired by the repair system, at least by the one that's floating around in the cell. So when that happens, P53 stops the cell cycle. It stops everything in its tracks. And P53 is also a transcription factor. So it binds to and stimulates the promoters of DNA repair proteins. So it invokes a strong response in terms of DNA repair proteins because it knows it's got a problem with the replication of the DNA and the problem is very likely related to the repair. Those repair proteins go and try to do their thing. If they can complete their mission of repairing the DNA, then P53 gets a signal that everything is OK. And P53 then allows the cell to proceed through mitosis, and everybody's happy. If P53 does not get the signal, saying everything's OK, then P53 puts the cell through suicide. It's called apoptosis, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. The second P is silent, apoptosis. Apoptosis is cellular suicide. And for a multicellular organism, this is a very important protection because it makes it less likely that a cell that has had damage is going to go forward. It's going to die instead. Well, P53 is a tumor suppressor because when it's functioning normally, it's protecting the body against damaged cells that might become cancerous. If you damage or you lose P53, what do you suppose is going to happen? You're going to have damaged cells that are going to survive, and those damaged cells can become uncontrolled growth. So if you lose P53 function, you can actually
develop, be much more likely to develop cancer. And so when we look in various tumors, one of the things that we see mutated sometimes is p53, because the cell has lost its ability to double check itself and take itself out of action. Okay. Yes. Is there anything that checks p53? You'd like to have an infinite set of checks, wouldn't you? Uh, there's not something that specifically checks p53. No, not that I'm aware of. Yes, sir. p53 is pretty good at its job. Um, the fact that there are trillions of cells in you that are existing, none of which are at the moment causing uncontrolled growth that you're aware of, um, is pretty good evidence. And the fact that you can stay alive typically for you know, 50 to 70 years without too much of a worry about that, P53 does a pretty good job. Um, it, when we see the mutations in P53, then we see some real problems. And um, so that tells us that it's performing a very important function. Jade? So you're talking about a benign versus a, um, a metastatic um, tumor? OK. So a benign tumor is, is uh, basically a controlled growth. It's not metastasizing. It will not uh, basically lose its connections, and all this, the cells spread in the body. Metastasis is the type of uh, malignant uh, cancer is one that can metastasize and let go of cells. It's when the, uh, a tumor metastasizes that basically you are dead because uh, it's gone, it'll go all the way through your body. A, a, a benign tumor won't do that. So uh, benign tumors you can, you can live with. Um, I read an interesting story the other day about a guy who had a, uh, a benign tumor on his brain that he carried for a long time before they finally removed it because it was starting to cause him some problems. But it wasn't going to metastasize and, and let go of its cells. OK, other questions? OK, I've got to move forward because we've got to g cover more ground. You know how the race is in this class, guys. Let's talk about carbohydrate structure. This is, a lot of this is going to be a review, so I'm going to go through this um, kind of fast, but I will try not to go too fast. Carbohydrate. So what's a carbohydrate? Well, the word, again, tells us what it does or what it is. Carbo, meaning carbon. Hydrate, meaning water. So carbohydrates are li literally hydrates of water. Okay, Hydrates of water. If I have a carbohydrate that has three carbons in it, it's known as a triose, T-R-I-O-S-E. Its formula will be C3H6O3, which I could write as C, parentheses, H2O, bigger parentheses, 3, carbon hydrated, right? If I have a four-carbon a four-carbon carbohydrate, I have a tetrose. Its formula would be C4H8O4. Again, twice as many hydrogens as I have oxygens or carbons. A pentose has five carbons, C5H10O5. Okay. A hexose has six carbons. C6, H12, O6. And all of these have um, similarity of structure. There, are, there is some diversity that we'll talk about, but they all have similarity of structure. The simplest ones uh, that we will talk about here have three carbons. Okay? Glyceraldehyde is a simple three-carbon carbohydrate. And dihydroxyacetone is a simple three-carbon uh, carbohydrate. If you look at these two, you see the, f the two fundamental types of carbohydrate. These are known as the aldoses, meaning that they contain an aldehyde group. So glyceraldehyde is an aldose, and there's the aldehyde group right there. The other main type of carbohydrate is known as the ketoses, and there's a ketone group right there. So these basically have a double bonded oxygen on either carbon number one if they're an aldose, or carbon number two, if they're a ketose. Oop, this thing is telling me something. I think it's running out of juice. What's it doing? Oop. OK, we'll turn it off. Oh, I'm sorry. Aldose. So an aldose is, oh, so this is a glyceraldehyde. This is dihydroxyacetone. 
and you'll see these elsewhere also. Now, there are only a few structures in the carbohydrates I'm going to ask you to memorize the structure of. I will tell you which ones, okay? There's only about four or five of them that are sugars, and they're common sugars, and the reason I ask you to memorize them is because you're going to need to know them for other classes anyway, so you might as well learn them here, okay? None of these are in that category. Okay. If we look at a molecule like glyceraldehyde, we see that that central carbon has four different things attached to it. It has the aldehyde up here, it has a, hydro a, a hydrogen, it has a hydroxide, and it has a CH2OH. That means that that carbon is asymmetric, which means it can exist in two configurations. Now, biochemists are lazy people. They're lazier than organic chemists. We refer to two configurations, one being D and one being L. Okay? Now, how do we tell D from L? Well, on this one, it looks like, okay, well, here is the uh, D configuration because I've got, and this is just a, a, a space filling model, it's the same structure. If we have the next to the bottom carbon that has a hyd hydroxide on the right, it's a D. If we have the next to the last carbon with a hydroxide on the left, it is an L. So let me show you that with some other structures as I get moving along. The most common sugars that we see inside of cells are in the D configuration. Okay? So here's a little better uh, representation. Look at D-glucose. Here's D-glucose. It's got the next to the last um, hydroxide on the right, and you can see L-glucose has the next to the last hydroxide on the left. You'll also notice that D and L with a given name are mirror images of each other. So D-glucose is the mirror image of L-glucose. And mirror image, of course, means if it's on the right here, it's on the left here, right here, left here, left here, left here, right here, sorry, and right here, left here. I can't get my, my, my directions down right. So a D-glucose will be a mirror image of L-glucose. D-fructose would be a mirror image of L-fructose. Okay? Now, these are not mirror images because this is glucose and this is fructose, and they're both in the D-configuration because, again, I see there's the hydroxide on the right and there's the hydroxide on the right. Yes, sir? They are. These are all chiral centers. Because biochemists are lazy people, and we don't try to systematically name it. We use the naming configuration with the name here as opposed to doing the RS configuration for everything going through there. We could do that, but it makes for a much more complicated name, and these sugar names have been around for a long time that we just simply use the name of the sugar to designate a specific structure. Yep. Now, um, here are two structures you'll need to know, fructose and glucose, the two most common sugars on the face of the earth, okay, fructose and glucose. So memorize those. And the beauty here is I've, sh I've drawn these to show you that they're very similar. Look at the configuration at the bottom of fructose, right? CH2OH, CH2OH. Hydroxide on the right, hydroxide on the right. Hydroxide on the right, hydroxide on the right. Hydroxide on the left, hydroxide on the left. The only difference between fructose and glucose is that fructose is a ketose, meaning it has a, a ketone at position 2, whereas glucose is an aldose, meaning it has a, a uh, aldehyde at position 1. Okay? So by learning one, you learn both as long as you remember that fructose is a ketose and glucose is an aldose. Yes? That is a bond. That should be a bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, should be a, should be a bar there. It might even be there. It was just faint, I think, on that. But yeah, that is a bar there. Okay. The most common sugars that we see are actually hexoses. There are a few pentoses, uh, and I'll have you memorize one of those. Uh, I'll mention that in a second. All right. Now. Let's uh, look at, uh, for example, D erythros, D and L erythros. All right? Well, first of all, I told you they have to be mirror images. So if I know the structure of D erythros, I can easily figure the structure of L erythros because they simply have to mirror all of the hydroxyls. Similarly, if I look at D threos and L threos, I know that they are mirror images of each other and everything aligns properly there. Now, what about D erythros and D? Are they 
mirror images? They are not. Okay? And so we have another name that we give to sugars that have the same chemistry, that is, they're both aldoses, and the same number of carbons, but different configurations. Okay? We call these guys diastereomers, D-I-A-S-T-E-R-E-O-M-E-R-S, -E -E diastereomers. These are two sugars that have the same chemistry, but different configuration, even though they have the same number of carbons. Okay? All of these are stereoisomers. So stereoisomers are the big category of things. Diastereomers, a subcategory, and the mirror images have a name as well. So the name that we give to molecules that are mirror images are known as enantiomers. E-N-A-N T-I-O M as in Michael E-R-S, diastereomers. I, I'm enantiomers. <laughs> I can't even pronounce it after I spelled it. Enantiomers. Okay. Yes? Yeah, diastereomers are molecules that have the same chemistry, meaning they're both, in this case, aldoses. It could both be ketoses, for example have the same number of carbons, but have different configurations that are not mirror images. Okay. Get that written down. All right. Now, one of the things you learn, learned, I hope, in organic chemistry is that sugars can exist in two configurations, one that we call a straight chain or Fischer projection. So Fischer, uh, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, uh, showed that uh, sugars could have this configuration. And they can also exist in a cyclic configuration known as a Hayworth projection, named for the person who discovered that. It turns out that in solution, that is when we have these dissolved in water, they can readily flip between the, the linear form and the circular form. Okay? Very important thing. When we make the circular form, though, we actually make a new asymmetric center that did not exist before. So for example, if we look at carbon number one here, it's not an asymmetric center. However, when we go through the cyclization process, this oxygen actually um, interacts with this carbon and converts this guy into an OH. So carbon number one up here has four different things attached to it. One, two, three, four. Whereas this carbon only had three things attached to it. So we've created a new asymmetric carbon in the process of cyclization. That carbon also has a name, a lot of names here. It's called the anomeric carbon, A-N-O-M-E-R-I-C. These two carbons are called anomers. I'm sorry, these two sugars are called anomers of each other because they differ in the configuration of that carbon. You'll see here the carbon, I'm sorry, the, of that hydroxyl. Here you'll see the hydroxyl is written in the down configuration. Here it's written in the upward configuration. Now I told you that you would need to know the structure of glucose and the structure of fructose, and that's true both for the linear form as well as the circular forms. Now I've got a fairly easy way to do that. People say, well, does left mean up or down and so forth? And to be honest, I never memorized that because I think it just gets too, too confusing. Instead, I memorize one of the circles. So glucose, I memorized many years ago when I was your age, is down, down, up, down, up. Down, down, up, down, up. Okay? That refers to alpha D-glucose. Down, down, up, down, up. Okay? Where the, here, the, the CH2OH going up, means it's in the D configuration. If it were going down, it would be in the L configuration. Okay? Everybody got down, down, up, down, up? If you know that, you can say, oh, well, I could figure out the structure of fructose because it's the same structure as glucose. However, fructose, as we will see, doesn't have a six-member ring. It has a five-member ring, and we'll see how that comes about in a minute. But this simply shows how that cyclization occurs. I'm not going to ask you to show the intermediate or any of that business. But this cyclization can happen with carbon number one interacting with carbon number five. It can also happen with carbon number one interacting with carbon number four. 
And if it did that, it would make a five-member ring instead of a six-member ring. We're not going to draw that. We will draw it for fructose, where two interacts with five. But we're not going to draw this for glucose. Okay? Sugars that exist in a six-member ring okay, are called pyranoses. So P-Y-R-A-N-O-S-E refers to sugars in a six-membered ring. Sugars in a six-membered ring. If we have sugars in a five-membered ring, they're called furanoses. F-U-R-A-N-O-S-E. A furanose. So you have a pyranose versus a furanose. And pyranoses get named for the fact that here's a molecule called pyrin. And it resembles what this guy looks like, right? There's the oxygen found there to a carbon, okay? This has other differences from this, but that's the general structure of a pyrin, and this is uh, a pyranose. Another thing I should point out about names is the letters O-S-E at the, le at the end of anything refers to a sugar. So you see glucose, fructose, pyranose, furanose, okay? Threose. Okay. Glyceraldehyde breaks that rule, but all the others have oses, O-S-E, on the end. Uh, let's see. I'll come back to that. Okay, with projections. So here is what a furanose will look like. Okay, here and the furanose will have a five-membered ring. And notice, by the way, in the case of the Hayworth projection for glucose, remember glucose has six carbons. I always encourage you to uh, number the carbons. All right. So if we look at glucose, this would be carbon one, two, three, four, five, and then remember we had one up here, six. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, could you elucidate one more time what down, down, up, down, up, what you're going to refer to? The hydroxides, but yeah, sure, I'll be happy to. In fact, we can see it right here. So here's, here's alpha D-glucose. And when I do down, down, up, down, up, I'm referring to the hydroxides off of each carbon. Okay, down, down, up, down, and then the CH2OH up. Alpha? That makes it alpha. That's right. So if I had beta, I would have up, down, up, down, up. Make sense? Okay. Now, sugars are interesting when we put them into a cyclic form. When we put them into a cyclic form, this, these bonds can twist in two ways and still have the same general chemical structure. That is, in space, they can fill two different ways. They can, they can fit two different ways. One's called the chair configuration. And it's called the chair because this looks like it's the back of a chair, and this looks like it's a chase lounge where we got the thing dropping off here in the front. Here's where your butt would sit right here. Okay, This is the chair configuration. If I had a different configuration, it's called the boat configuration. And if that happened, then this part would be lifted up here. And so it would look a little bit like a canoe. I'd have this, then I'd have that, and then I'd have it going up like this. Both of those could exist for this, for example. Okay, So boat versus chair. The chair will generally, as you can imagine seeing it here, be more stable because it has less steric hindrance. These guys are less likely to be bouncing into other things when this is pointed down in a way than if this is pointed up. Okay? So boat versus chair is an important uh, confirmation that exists for sugars. OK, let's see. One quick one here. Um, Actually, let's not. Yeah, I'll, I'll brief you. OK. So sugars, don't you love it when I do that? I, I do try to minimize what I, what I make you responsible for. But um, one of the things that you learn in organic chemistry is that aldehydes are relatively unstable. Aldehydes will readily oxidize and become acids. By contrast, ketones are not quite so chemically unstable. Right? They will hang around for longer, and they're not nearly as easily oxidized. It's therefore important that I understand that there's a difference between aldoses and ketoses. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, those are all. Yeah, there we go. There's the ketose. 
Okay, so this will readily oxidize and become a carboxylic acid. This can oxidize, but not nearly so readily. So we can imagine that aldoses like glucose will more readily oxidize than will ketoses like ketone, like, like uh, fructose. All right? That's an important consideration. And another important consideration actually relates to right here. Okay? We saw, I told you that in solution, this guy can go from here back and go down here. So in solution, they, the, uh, a sugar can readily change from alpha to beta and back and forth. And it does that by going through this form and then back over to here. But when it's in this form, look what we have. We have an aldehyde. Okay? We have an aldehyde. If this guy can go back to an aldehyde, it can readily be oxidized. Okay? And a sugar that can readily be oxidized is known as a reducing sugar. It gets oxidized, but something else gets reduced. So glucose is more of an oxidizing sugar, I'm sorry, reducing sugar, than is fructose. It's more readily oxidized than is fructose. Another thing I should point out about this cyclization, going from here, back to here, and over to here, is another class of molecules that are related to the sugars. And these are known as the glycosides. I'm going to show you on here before I take you through it, but a glycoside is a molecule that's had its anomeric hydroxyl altered in some way. The anomeric hydroxyl has been altered in some way in a glycoside. Now, why do I tell you that on this figure instead of showing you? I'm going to show you one in a second. I show you on this figure because when I have a glycoside, it can't go back here. It's stuck where it's at. It can't flip between beta and alpha and alpha and beta. It cannot exist as a linear form. It's stuck in whatever form it's in when it becomes that glycoside. Okay. Let's take a quick look at a glycoside structure, and then I will do our song for the day. Okay. So here's a simple glycoside. Here is beta D glucopyranose. Okay. And we can see uh, the hydroxyl up. We put a methyl on that. This guy would be stuck in this configuration. It could not flip to an alpha. And it would not be a readily oxidized sugar either. So both of those things would make this a much more stable compound and with a specific configuration that couldn't flip. Some of you may have heard of Latril, which is a compound that some people for a long time thought had magical properties. It probably doesn't. Um, the magical properties probably arose from that thing right there, which is known as cyanide, which kills things found in apricot pits. People have heard of Latril? Anybody heard of Latril? OK. It was a, something that was a very fatty thing back in the 70s, and people thought it was the, the, the great um, medicine that was going to fix everything in the world. It killed a lot of things. OK. Um, questions before I go into our song for the day? OK. This is a real simple one. It's called Heart to Sucrose. Carbohydrates all should sing, glory to the Hayworth ring. And O oh Mary, carbons hide when they're in a glycoside. Glucopyranose is there in the boat or in the chair. Alpha, beta, D, and L. Diastereomer hell, alpha, beta, D, and L. Diastereomer hell. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs>